Our final session of the day features American Atheist's president, Nick Fish. He's a seasoned civil rights and civil liberties activist with more than a decade of political organizing and leadership experience. He's been with American Atheists in various roles since 2012 and has been the president of American Atheists since 2018. And considering all the things we've talked about, it's a perfect capstone to the day. He's going to talk about where we go from here. Boss, <laughs> Nick, take it away if you're here. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, thank you Abby, for the, the very kind introduction. And I just want to, um, once again, just thank all of the really outstanding panelists and speakers and moderators that we've had today. Um, you know, I think that this conference in particular and, and the, the topics that we've chosen to discuss really are a, an important cross section for looking at how we proceed from here. What What is going to come next? Um, because I, I think we're, we're really at a, a point in American political culture and American culture more generally, where the tide is shifting, where, where the ground is shifting under our feet and how we respond to those changes um, really are going to determine what happens next. Um, and that's something that Allison did a really fantastic job talking about um, earlier this afternoon. Um, and something that I, I think all of us should spend a lot of time reflecting on and, and thinking about um, as far as how we, um, calibrate our activism and, and the things that we want to emphasize moving forward. Um, and so I, I want to refer back to a quote uh, from Madeline Murray O'Hare, and um, this isn't one of her more famous ones, and it's sort of an idea that I think a lot of us um, have had, but I, it's something that is, was in her writing that I found really resonant. Um, and it, it was, um, I don't care whether or not I succeed uh, or whether I fail as long as I'm trying, but I hope that I succeed. And I think that's uh, right at the core of what we do here. Um, we, we really do care about um, making a difference, um, but it's always striving for the next thing. It's always, a, it's a journey. It's not about finding the final place of equality or, um, or, or arriving at a destination. It's about constantly working to improve ourselves, improving our communities, improving the groups that we lead and improving our activism. Um, but I do think it's important to hope that we succeed and to do everything we can to succeed because we're talking often about life and death, um, life and death circumstances for the people around us. We're talking about um, very real impacts on people's lives when we're talking about public policy, um, when we're talking about politics, when we're talking about communities, when we're talking about any of these things, we're talking about um, how that intersects with people's lives. And um, unfortunately, um, too often those are seen as games or, or an academic exercise, when in fact it's, it's anything but. People in um, communities throughout this country, especially highly religious, highly controlling communities, um, face life and death consequences because of their lack of access to things like healthcare, uh, because of things like supportive communities. They, they have profound mental health um, challenges and, and repercussions because they're not supported. And that's something that our survey showed. It's something that, that we collected data on and was crystal clear that, that the experiences of atheists who live in places like New Jersey or New York or, um, or, or other cities are very different than those who live in um, places like rural Alabama or Arkansas or uh, Wyoming or even small towns in what we would consider blue states. And I, I hate framing things in that political way but it's often kind of how we think about these things. And so um, I'm just gonna use that terminology. Um, but people experience their atheism and experience religion in very different ways, depending on where they are in this country. And this is a very big country with diverse experiences. And you've heard it in many of the panels. Um, we just heard from folks who are parents, um, many of whom who were, I think all of whom were not raised in particularly religious environments, but still struggle with every day navigating uh, the, the challenges of being an atheist parent in the United States, because it is a very challenging place to be. Um, so I think we need to be upfront about confronting the reasons why things that we do don't work. Um, really interrogating our failures and, and doing everything we can to do better. Um, and so that starts with looking at places where our advocacy hasn't worked. Um, and I think that's a really crucial place for us to start today. Um, one of the things that we failed at uh, for years was engaging with allies, finding people who were uh, who shared our values, but 
uh, on one particular topic, but maybe disagreed somewhere else, um, and not engaging with that, not engaging more broadly, and branching out and finding um, people to help us build power. Um, the way that you exercise political power in the United States is to build a coalition, to build partnerships, and to find allies. Um, and that's something that we've put a, a huge amount of time and re resources into over these past few years. And it's something that I know um, all of my counterparts throughout the atheist community and the, the secular groups work very hard at uh, because we recognize that um, we're right on the, the edge, we're right on the precipice of exerting real political power. And it's something that Congressman Huffman said last night, that we're, we're really growing up right now and that we have an opportunity right now if we can seize it, if we can build that power. And so step number one is finding those allies. Um, another re place that we've, uh, another reason that we've not succeeded in the past is stigma. And that's something that, you know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not our fault. Um, the stigma that our community faces is endemic. It's something that um, has extended for generations. Um, and so, you know, failures aren't necessarily just on us. Sometimes they're big structural things that we need to confront and that take quite a lot of time. And so uh, we need to work better to break that down um, and confront that stigma uh, wherever we can. And there are lots of ways to do that. And you heard um, many ways that we can confront that stigma and, and work to break down prejudices and, and um, sort of undo years of learned uh, stigmatization uh, for, for religious folks who, uh, you know, look at us and are very scared sometimes. <laughs> Um, the other thing that we've done that we need to do a better job on is siloing our activism, siloing the work that we do. So staying very narrowly focused, um, not just on our issues, but also um, within our organizations. So collaborating more, being in contact with our allies, our friends, and making sure that we're working on um, the same issues or um, our, making sure our messaging makes sense together and not duplicating efforts. And that's something that um, I'm really pleased with the way that this community has risen to that challenge over the past few years. Um, we've really gone out of our way to be as collaborative and and um, and, and uh, in communication as possible um, so that we're not duplicating efforts. We have finite resources. And I think as uh, some other folks have mentioned, uh, certainly in the elected official side of things and in the Christian nationalist uh, panel, the other side has resources that we could only imagine. Um, a recent survey that was put out by Christianity Today um, said that the other side spent uh, in the last year something like $150 million on so-called religious liberty issues and another $50 million on anti-choice and anti-LGBT advocacy specifically. Um, that type of resources we can't come up against, we can't compete with that if we're not collaborating, if we're not um, sort of sharing what we're doing and we're not being efficient with our, our time and our money. Um, and so that's that's a key part of this as well. And finally, um, I think one of our failures has been uh, sort of an over-focus on the hypothetical, on, on not focusing in on the real world implications of the work that we do, how this uh, all this stuff interacts with people's day-to-day -day lives. And that really is a key part of what so many people today have been talking about, has been really emphasizing how families and you know the groups that we put together um, have an impact in people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so, you know, that's interrogating that and really looking at some of those failures, um, I think is has to be the first starting point. Uh, but, you know, this isn't all <laughs> cause for concern or there's there's a lot here that we've succeeded at as well. Um, you know, we, we have groups that are um, emerging out and really being highly successful that are making a huge difference in their communities. Um, they've done fantastic work branching out um, and, and being real forces within the community for good. Um, and that really heartens me and, and gives me a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of hope for the future. Um, one thing that you know, folks have, have mentioned throughout this, uh, this, this pan these panels today is that we have a lot of catch up work to do on churches. Um, churches have had decades, centuries to build a lot of these structures uh, that we're just starting out with. And so finding um, places where we can borrow from them, things that fit within our values, but that meet a need um, that isn't exclusively, uh, that isn't the exclusive property of a church. Um, that's what we should be doing. Um, the family panel spoke to that. And I, and I think a lot of our, um, our local activist folks spoke to that as well, um, that this is not, the, these 
supporting local communities, supporting people, um, making food for somebody who is, um, you know, <laughs> pregnant or about to give birth, making making sure that somebody has access to food, um, making sure that everybody's being taken care of. This is not the exclusive domain of religion. Uh, these are things that we do as human beings because we care about one another and because we're we're connected to each other. Um, we have to be self-reflective about where we fail um, and do things to um, grapple with the shortcomings and respond to criticism without getting defensive. And I think that's um, a core part of what it means to be um, an atheist for me. But anyway, let's let's talk about some of the places where we're succeeding. Um, we started with um, number one, which I, Allison mentioned, and, and I, I really want to congratulate her on and, and thank her for, is getting a better understanding of our community. Um, we claim to care a lot about data and facts and figures, uh, but we didn't have a real comprehensive look at what our community looked like. We didn't know what our community cared about most, and we found some really um, interesting information in there that can help us guide our activism as we move forward. But it also is information about the experiences that people face and allows us to dedicate time and effort and money uh, to developing resources to help people. Um, so many of our partners who are here this weekend um, fill that niche as well. Um, I, I can't tell you how proud I am to work with groups like Recovering From Religion um, or, um, uh, or the Secular Coalition for America or um, any number of, uh, of other groups that go out of their way to fill those niches within our community to meet the needs of the folks who comprise our community. Uh, the second one is we've gotten really, gotten a lot better at political engagement. Um, being an atheist, um, I think, is an inherently political act. Um, being out as an atheist is an inherently political act. It's, um, it's an act of transgressing uh, Christian uh, hegemony, uh, hegemony uh, particularly in a country here where um, being a Christian or Christianity is so elevated and so privileged and, and given such power in our culture um, that declaring your atheism is an important and often um, crucial statement about your values. Uh, and so I, I, I think that that's something that we're getting better at is, is embracing that. Um, we, we often hear people tell us, and this is something that we get criticized for occasionally, and I think that any group leader uh, will recognize this as well, is telling people to you know just keep religion or keep politics out of this. I didn't come here to talk about politics, um, but I think that all of this is politics. Everything is politics. Um, culture is politics, and it's something that Christian nationalists have done a really great job of linking together, uh, understanding that policy is downstream from uh, culture, um, and if you can create these sort of culture war um, totems, that you can really do a lot to advance a particular policy outcome. Um, and as I said, I think that it's important for us to recognize that our atheism is inherently a political act. It's, an, it's a political label as well. And we should embrace that. Um, we should be open and honest about desiring to build a better country and a build better world for ourselves and for the people who come after us. Um, and the only way to do that is through politics. It's engaging in the act of politics. Um, on all of these issues, part of the, the core mission of our local activism has been encouraging people to be atheists everywhere. And I think that this is something that, um, that Dusty said in our previous panel is that when you're, uh, when you're an atheist uh, and a parent, you're always an atheist and you're always a parent. You can't shut off being a parent when you come to, 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 to your atheist activism, but you also can't shut off being an atheist when you come to, or when you go to other types of actions and activities and, and, and social events. Um, and I think that's really important. And asking people um, to not put your atheism on a shelf and hide it away is a really important component for breaking down all of that stigma and for um, being more visible in our communities. It's very easy sometimes to pretend that we're not atheists as a way to avoid conflict, um, but it does nothing to advance our ultimate goal, which is to build a better world for those who come after us. Um, it's, it's at the center of what it means to uh, try to succeed. Um, and something that I've talked about for a couple of years now and, and that I um, mentioned in my first um, talk at an American Atheist Conference as president was improving our storytelling, being better storytellers. Um, this is something that American Atheist has really tried to emphasize over the last few years, um, connecting the theoretical to the tangible, um, connecting constitutional law to real world consequences. Um, it's not enough 
unfortunately for us just to be right or to have reason on our side. Um, we have to show how religion impacts people's day-to-day -day lives and what the stakes are and how those policies impact people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, we do that by emphasizing our values, by, by talking about um, how all of these religious nationalism, Christian nationalist policies um, cause profound harm and how religion, um, highly controlling religious environments, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, um, can cause really profound harms to people, uh, to their mental health, to their, their physical health, uh, to their well-being, um, and, and so on. Um, and you saw a lot of those values on display this weekend. Um, values like people coming together to ensure that no one in their community is going without food, um, making sure that families are supported, uh, that we're building communities that look like the surrounding area and that are as inclusive or more inclusive than the broader culture. Um, values that you know LGBTQ equality matters, that, that Black lives matter, that democracy and pluralism and self-determination are fundamental values that aren't up for negotiation. Um, all of those things and, and living those values says who we are and it allows us to find common ground to build that political power with potential allies. And that's crucial if we're going to be successful. Um, going hand in hand with that is thinking about how we're approaching um, the activism that we do. Um, for years, um, we've primarily used the court system as a way to protect the wall of separation. And Allison mentioned this um, as something that, you know, maybe we need to rethink how we're framing this. Um, is it enough to say that we're protecting the wall of separation or do we need to instead say the wall of separation has crumbled and we need to rebuild it? Um, I, th I think we're in agreement that it's more the latter. Um, looking at the court system, looking at where public policy stands right now, um, there's not much of a wall left to protect. And that's, um, that's a hard thing to admit sometimes, but if there's any group that's best positioned to tell hard truths about the state of reality, it's American Atheists. And I'm really proud to uh, lead an organization that's willing to say that sometimes, that, that these hard truths need to be addressed, that the wall of separation has um, been under attack for decades, and that now we need to rethink how we talk about it and how we um, rebuild it at this point. Um, I've, I've talked about this a lot, that it's really appealing to us um, as atheists and the way that we've many of us came to atheism to think that um, the courts are always on our side and that if we just make the better argument that we're going to win. Um, that's I, I saw some conversation in the chat about stuff like that as well. Um, and that can be an appealing fiction that we tell ourselves. Um, but when the courts are deciding that um, churches should be allowed to ignore public health directives because grocery stores are open, um, I think we've entered a place where no matter how good your argument is, it may not matter. And that sort of realistic approach to things is something that we need to grapple with, that um, it's no longer enough or it's never been enough just for us to make the better argument. Um, we have to think outside that system. Um, this is a side effect as well of our movement sort of coming to age at what was sort of a, a historic time in our nation's history where the courts were used as a vehicle to advance civil rights. That's not always been the case. And in fact, that's very rarely been the case uh, in our nation's history. And so we're at a point now, though, where we have um, the, the beginnings of popular political power. Um, Congressman Huffman mentioned this, where, you know, we're talking about an organ, a, a community or a, a demographic that now represents more than a quarter, um, somewhere between a quarter and a third of Americans. We can seize political power and work to build a, a country that reflects our values if we're willing to engage and if we can get organized. Um, and, you know, the, the, the courts are not going to be there to protect us um, in, in the coming years because of the structures of the court and what's happened in recent years. And, you know, this is a really pessimistic way of saying that we need to think outside that very narrow box. Um, and so that's what we're doing. They can't be our be all end all, the courts anymore. We, we have to focus on political organizing and community building and building grassroots power. And, and that's what we're going to keep doing here at American Atheists. Um, the unprecedented expansion of religious privilege under the previous administration and that's been undertaken by the courts um, is a threat. It's a threat to our uh, core values every single day. And as I said, it puts people's lives at risk. 
Um, and it's, uh, I mean, it's an assault on common sense and we have to mobilize to push back on it. Um, and that means uh, popular democracy. Um, and that means not just relying on the courts to do it. Um, but this isn't all doom and gloom. Um, there's a lot to be hopeful about. Um, we have a Congressional Free Thought Caucus. I, I was speaking with Congressman Huffman um, yesterday before we started the, the session, and I said it was you know, unthinkable just a few years ago that a sitting member of Congress would speak to our community and that we would have this caucus. And, and that's thanks in no small part to the incredible work of our allies and our partners at, um, at the Free Thought Equality Fund and the American Humanist Association, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and Americans United, uh, and MAF and the Secular Student Alliance and the Secular Coalition, and the list just goes on and on and on, um, where we've all worked together to get to where we are now. Um, and that's a cause for profound, um, profound hope. Um, but we also have to recognize that only 24 states have open atheists in, in their state legislatures, um, when we know that atheists are in fact everywhere. <laughs> so we need to run for office. We need to, to make sure that this is not a political albatross around people's necks, that we, we support people in our community that share our values that are running for office um, and, and, and continue to destigmatize uh, serving in public office as an atheist. Um, we also have demographic change on our side, but I think it's important to recognize that this is not a magic bullet, um, that people always say, ah, in five years, it'll all be, this will all be better because demographics will have changed so much. You know, this one group will have died out. Young people are, um, just as evangelical as um, sort of middle-aged folks where a lot of the, the losses for religious groups are coming from mainline Protestants and Catholics. Um, and so there's a, a high chunk of evangelicals, especially in college campuses um, that uh, is sort of masked by the decline of uh, mainline Protestant uh, groups as well. So um, it's unclear exactly what that's going to look like in a few years, but we can't take it as a uh, fait accompli that, that you know, demographic change is going to be, is going to win the day. We have to continue advocating for and arguing for and um, getting out there and, and talking about our positions and, and talking about our values. And that's what we're going to keep doing. And that's what so many of the groups that you all lead and that you all are members of in your local communities, that's the crucial work that you do every day that we can't replicate uh, from a national organization, that it takes people on the ground, working hard every single day, volunteering, getting out there, um, and that's that's crucial. Um, that plays into the last bit of this, which is destigmatizing atheist identities, um, making sure that um, no one faces discrimination because of who they are and what they believe or don't believe. And it's not just enough to have quote unquote famous people, uh, people who uh, you know are celebrities or, or athletes or whatever. That's that's helpful sometimes. Um, but what's much more impactful is the people in your communities, um, talking to your family members, talking to the people that you go to school with, talking to the folks that you work with, and breaking down that stigma. And, and all of you do that uh, every single day, and I'm incredibly grateful for it because it's the most impactful thing we can do, but it's, not, but it's hard work and it takes time. And I think that that's the most crucial thing that we need to recognize today is that all of the work that we do is gonna take time and it takes investment and it takes effort and it takes energy. And we're incredibly grateful to have um, people in all 50 states that are willing and able to provide all of those things. Um, and so with that, I will um, just close with a thought from uh, Tracy Benefield that I, uh, just one thing that I wanna repeat because I thought it was so great of speak up, be brave, don't be afraid to speak on behalf of all atheists because there's no Pope of atheism. Just go out there and um, and be brave. And thank you all for doing that. And I think we can bring back on Debbie now. There she is. Hi, Debbie. Where is my tab? <laughs> <laughs> I clicked the thing. It was gone. Welcome back. Um, I'm happy to say I think we have a, some time here for um, a few questions as well. Um, and I'm happy to take those. I don't know if anyone has dropped any in the chat or not, but if anyone has any last minute questions, I'm happy to pop those in here as well. But if not, we can certainly pause for our break. We're about three minutes out, so. Do you think we're winning? Yeah, I do. Um, I think we're winning in a lot of ways. I think that, um, and you and I have had this conversation and I see my 
cat has joined, so that's great. Um, <laughs> um, I think we are winning. Um, I think that the these sort of throws, these last throws of a, of a shrinking group that's seeing its demographic and its political power shrinking are, are going to be really damaging though. Um, I think that the, the anti-democratic institutions or inclinations of this group are a threat to the American political experiment. I think that um, we're, we're, we're seeing lots of people right now um, really grapple with Christian power and, and, you know, really the evangelical Christian power that is, um, you know, that, that's a threat to their health and their well-being, as I mentioned. Um, and, and it's sort of cold comfort to say, hey, we're winning when you live in a state where, you know, you're, a doctor can turn you away because they don't like that you're trans or that, you know, your family can be excluded from adoption and foster care uh, because you're in a same-sex marriage. Uh, or any, or you're denied basic social services because the only provider in your community is a religious provider, and we've, you know, gutted a social safety net to such an extent that um, people have to rely on religious groups. Um, that's cold. The, the the idea that we're going to win in five or six years, quote unquote, win in five or six years is cold comfort for those people who who need the help right now. Um, and so I think we um, we can't just let sit back and let let the success wash over us. Um, we need to go out there and, and grab it and provide and make sure that we're taking care of the people um, and doing everything we can to speed up that process um, and just make sure that nobody is left behind in, in, in this in this process. Left behind. <laughs> that wasn't I will say that was intentional. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, there's a great question. How should we be engaging religious organizations, uh, even Christian organizations in good faith? I think it's a great question. The thing that's most important for us, and, and we do engage with religious allies, is come at it from a place of values. Um, we're really proud to partner with groups like the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice or Catholics for Choice on reproductive health issues because there's common ground there. Um, we're going to absolutely disagree on lots of things with Catholics for Choice, um, but we're going to profoundly and strongly agree um, with their advocacy on expanding and making sure that um, everyone has access to reproductive health care um, and that Catholic doctrine is not the thing that's determining whether or not you have access to birth control or abortion. Um, and so going back to that fundamental thing of, of a value and, and finding that nugget of, of, shared, uh, of a shared value is, is where to start. There's another interesting question here, but then it scrolled away. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't in the it was a, in the chat. But I agree with you. How should no no that was one. How do we build relationships abroad to fight this growing coalition? That's a really interesting one because I know we've talked about the fact that. I mean, for an organization like American Atheists, of course, American is right there in the title. However, mm -hmm. yep. it's clear that <laughs> the groups that we're fighting against are not just dangerous in America, right? Like yeah. the Alliance Defending Freedom, one of our right. favorite enemies. That was sarcasm. We yeah. hate them. But <laughs> <laughs> one of our great. opponents, our cultural opponents. <laughs> but, uh, how do we build yeah. relationships abroad to fight the growing coalition? Yeah, this is a... An a question that I think we we grapple with all the time because clearly in the United States, um, you know, atheists don't have it so bad. Um, we're not thrown in jail. We're not, um, you know, we're not put in. Uh, we're not we're not regularly killed by mobs for being um, apostates. I mean, that's just not something that's happening. It is legal to be an atheist in America. Um, and so, how do we, as American atheists, I mean, as you said, it's it's in the name of the group. We we focus on our policy expertise. Our organizing expertise is here in the United States. How do we do a better job of supporting groups abroad? Number one, we rely on the expertise of other groups um, and people who have spent a lot of time understanding human rights laws and international uh, norms and, and have contacts on the ground in these other countries. And so we're very proud of our membership in Humanist International and our collaboration with them. Um, they have a really outstanding staff that, that does phenomenal work um, and you know, supports local groups that are all throughout the world 
Um, I think they have members or affiliate groups in something like 90 some odd countries, which is great. Um, Debbie is actually on the board of Humanist International. Uh, so I'd be <laughs> <laughs> remiss if I didn't mention that. I forgot. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really that's important and a new member of the board. So that's great. They have a booth here uh, as well at our conference. Go check them out. Sign up for their alerts. Um, support their work. Um, it, it's really crucial that we are in these coalitions. Um, but it's also important to recognize that here in the U.S., um, so much of what happens in American foreign policy impacts and has knock-on effects for what happens elsewhere. Um, we're talking about things like the Mexico City policy, where uh, under the Trump administration, um, organizations that received grant money from the U.S. State Department and from USAID were forbidden from talking about or not just providing abortion, but talking about or referring anyone to receive an abortion um, or other types of family planning services, even though they're funded by the American taxpayer. Um, and so they were in some ways silenced, um, forced not to talk about things that the, current, the incumbent administration found, um, you know, antithetical to their religious values. Um, and so people who were receiving grant money ostensibly for family planning services and grants for dealing with sex trafficking and, and exploitation of women and, and young people um, were forbidden from, you know, providing comprehensive health care, um, which is terrible. Uh, we're not giving people access to the resources they need. We're instead sort of pretending that this doesn't exist or that this isn't a problem. Um, and as Debbie alluded to, uh, because they've found less and less success in American politics, some of these groups have exported their hate, have done the things like the, you know, the kill the gays bill or the, um, you know, banning discussions of, you know, LGBT issues. Um, and that's a, that's not an uncommon thing. Um, but so, you know, supporting groups that have on the ground access in, in these other countries, recognizing that the United States foreign policy is in a unique position to um, influence norms and, and, talk about our values and lead by example is a really crucial part of that. And those are things that we're doing. Um, I did see one other question about funding sources and fundraising goals. Are they adequate for the work of American atheists? Uh, the short answer to that is, you know, we American atheists has a budget uh, in the neighborhood of, you know, one and a half to $2 million a year. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom has a budget in the neighborhood of, you know, 25 to $50 million, depending on the year. Um, and so, you know, we need to start, and this is something that we've spent a lot of time doing is um, laying the framework and laying a groundwork for um, more robust systems, more um, exp easier expansion, slow, steady growth of the organization over time, so that we're not put in a position where it's, you know, there's only two or three of us doing this. American Atheist right now actually has more staff than we've had at any point in our history um, since the, the, the mid 90s, since the um, the deaths of uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare and um, or the O'Hare family. So, um, you know, we're, we're growing slowly and steadily. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if anyone in the chat has, you know, 10 to $20 million laying around that you'd like to, <laughs> you'd like to send us, please get in touch. We'd love to chat um, and, and, you know, build something that's sustainable because that's what this is all about is, you know, having $20 million once is great, um, but building out a system that allows us to, grow from $2 million to $5 million to $10 million over the course of the next five to 10 years would be much more impactful. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at now is, is making sure that we have that slow, steady, sustainable growth um, over the course of the next few years. And, you know, I will say, thanks to the generosity of our members, um, we're actually exiting the COVID. Well, I don't want to say that it's over yet, but um, we've, maintained and actually been, um, we've saved some money over the course of the last year uh, because we haven't traveled. <laughs> we haven't done some of the things that we would normally do, um, but our revenues have actually gone up a little bit over the past year because people have dug deeper and have supported our work and they've seen um, you know, just how impactful the state level work and the resources that we're creating and all of that have been. And so if this is valuable, if you feel this is valuable, we, we hope you'll continue to support our work uh, because we can't do it without you. Very true. And that's not just if you have 10 or $20 million laying around, of course, <laughs> though if you, you have do, 10 or 20. Yeah, please, well. <laughs> <laughs> please call us, call, get your friend with the 10 or 20 million to call us. I mean, the, the it's rare that that kind of gift happens, but um, you know, the impact that a million extra, I hate to say extra because that means so much, you know, for, for an advocacy organization, 
a million dollars, it would double our staff. We'd have twice as many lawyers and twice as many field organizers and twice as many posters that we can mail to local groups and a much better website and like all of these different resources that can help that would significantly increase our capacity and the amount of work that we are able to do in all of these different arenas. You know, there's times when different staff have to say like, I, there's, I have no space to join another coalition, basically. <laughs> no I have no time to be on like one more phone call a week with right. a great group, but like, we just don't have the bodies in place. And we do, as you've heard across the conference, like volunteers are plugged in and working on stuff, but lawyer volunteers, lawyers are busy. Lawyers are busy people. And there are a lot of things that they could work on and people with higher level skills, you know, you don't want to ask like videographers to please contribute 15 hours a week to, to edit video for free. That's really unfair and unjust. So we also tried to be fair, provide space for people to volunteer as we've asked to get people involved on the ground, have an impact where they are, which a national organization can't focus on everywhere unless there are people on the ground. Right. And so, you know, this is a movement and this is advocacy and this is grassroots. Yeah. And that means a bunch of people working together um, and supporting it with their, with their time and their money and their ideas. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's how we get the things done. That's how we fight the scary Christian nationalists <laughs> and the others out there. So yeah, but thank you. Trying to change the world here. Yep. <laughs>